Erev Tov Kharim, and uh, it is always a good chance to get to come and speak about the Lord to you guys. Um, scripture I shared with you the other day, and this is kind of a follow-up from the video that we did uh, a couple of days ago that has uh, really, um, well, I would have to say most people have enjoyed the video, have appreciated the, the, uh, the information, more so warning us about the hour that we're living in. Uh, I don't like to, to put it as an absolute that we're in the 70th week of Daniel, but I would say that it is certainly, it points to the possibility that if we're not, we're very close to that time. Uh, as I mentioned to you guys from Revelation 11, from the Christian Bible, from my Jewish friends that listen in, um, it says that John was given the order to take a reed, uh, or he was given a reed likened to a rod, to measure the temple, the altar, but to leave out the outer court, for it's given to the Gentiles, and they will tread down the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now, this cannot apply to the Palestinians, per se, because the Palestinians have been there for a lot longer than 42 months. That is, before Israel's uh, victory in 1967. Uh, you know, there was a lot of fighting in Israel uh, from the independence of 1948 to 1967. 1967, they took uh, Jerusalem. They took the Temple Mount. Uh, of course, there was a great big international outcry, and Israel ended up giving that back to the, uh, to the Arab people. The Jordanians actually have uh, always claimed the control over that. The, uh, but, but nonetheless... Um, the scripture says it's going to be given to the Gentiles for 40 and two months. Now, the holy city that is, and that's things that are inside the walls, that, are, that is things on the outside of the walls, uh, Mount Zion being one of those things. Now, if the Gentiles are given control of the holy city, and they're, or they're going to, excuse me, they're going to tread the holy city for 40 and two months, which means that they're, they're you know, footsteps is possession uh, possession, uh, you know, it's like you've conquered that area. Uh, it's a temporal thing. It's not permanent. But it's clear, though, that we that the Gentiles get that for 42 months. Uh, that's the midst of the 70th week of Daniel where the covenant is broken. And when that covenant is broken, then all kinds of things take place. The wrath of God comes upon the earth. Uh, the judgment of God, the, the judgment of the great whore, which is the Vatican in Rome. And, and when, I, when I come down and I condemn the Vatican, please understand, there's, like today, uh, I was flipping through the channels there and I come across a Catholic channel, a nice young lady there, an Oriental young lady that was a nun, uh, and I could not help. My heart went out to this young woman. I thought, God, if she only knew what she was in, would she come out? Uh, that's the desire, is to see people will come out of the unbelief, come out of the ungodliness. So I pray that Catholic people that might watch this video, I, I pray that God will open your eyes. Take the time, pray about the things that we're saying. It's not to condemn you as individuals, but rather this is the system that Satan is using. That's something we're going to talk about tonight uh, that I want you to understand. So I want to take you back to Micah 4. Uh, for just a moment, Micah chapter 4, verse 9. Now, why dost thou cry aloud, speaking of Israel here, is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Now, as I've mentioned to you before, God is asking Israel about the king because Israel rejected God's provided way of using a prophet, Samuel, and they wanted a, a king like the rest of the world to lead them into battle. And of course, we're seeing that the king is failing. Uh, in this king case here, Shimon Perez or Benjamin Netanyahu, either way. Uh, in fact, Benjamin Netanyahu would be more appropriate because, in fact, when he was elected prime minister the first time, the children of Israel ran through the streets and cried out, Benny, king of the Jews. But it's not going to work because God's provided way is not just a prophet, but in this case, it's Mashiach. And uh, so he's got to fail. But when he also, when God questions them and he says, uh, why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? In other words, uh, what about your king that was supposed to lead you in battle? You don't have a king to deliver you? Since God, God is questioning Israel. 
So, you know, I know that when I did this video, there was uh, one lady that really uh, tried to condemn me majorly over this video, saying that I was cursing Israel. No, I don't curse Israel, but one thing I do do is I do call out against sin. And it doesn't matter if it's my own people or not, I must call out sin. And the reason being, like Ezra, when Ezra came in and, and discovered that Israel had, had married amongst the Babylonian daughters, which was ironic in itself, and this is something that Ezra brings out, we're, they were in captivity for 70 years down in Babylon. For what? For, for idolatry. And then they turn around and they marry amongst the daughters and, and the sons are, uh, they give their sons unto them as well. You know, they're swapping husband and wife, whatever the case may be, amongst the Babylonians. And the Bible says the chief among them, the politicians and the spiritual leaders were the guiltiest of all. And yet they know they went into Babylonian captivity because of all this nonsense of idolatry and things. And yet now they're marrying into it. I mean... Hello, can somebody tell me the greatest captivity Israel has ever gone into, the dispersion, the diaspora, is the one that happened in 70 AD, where the house of Judah, I mean, granted the house of Israel, 723 BCE, already had gone into captivity. They never got to see Mashiach. They went into captivity long before the Messiah ever come. And the house of Israel goes into captivity. Then, then, then we have the house of Judah goes into captivity. So any time we ever go into captivity, and we know this, that God sent the house of Israel into captivity because of their sins, because of uh, bringing in idols and, and worshiping everything that is totally ungodly. So the, the house of Judah knew better. And you go into captivity anyway for what? 2,000 years. In fact, the house of Israel, 2,700 years plus. The longest time of the diaspora in history. I mean, we had 480 years when Moses come and delivered us during the time of Egypt, 70 years under the Babylonian captivity. But Judah had to have done something pretty doggone bad to go into captivity in 70 AD. So, you know, Scratch your head, rabbis. I know that uh, you want to say, well, the Pharisees, we've been kept together. It was a great thing that God did. No, God kept the Pharisees together because the Pharisees were the ones that took and handed Yeshua over to the Romans. So, yes, he kept you there. He kept the Romans intact, too. Why? Because God is going to judge the Romans for the evils that they have done to Yeshua, as well as the evil they did to all the Christianity down through the ages. Don't call the Vatican Christian. The Catholic Church has the blood of all the saints upon their hand. 600 million plus Christians that were burnt at the stake for witches, what have you, everything else down through the Dark Ages. So, no, it's not a Christian organization whatsoever. Dominating in world politics as well as in the spiritual uh, realm paganistic spiritual realm, yes, they definitely dominate in all those areas. Uh, the reason why we see Rome back in Israel again and gaining control over Israel is because God is resetting the stage as it was 2,000 years ago. It's kind of why Micah 4 here <clears throat> says what it says. God asks the question, is there no king in thee? Uh, has your counselor perished? Uh, certainly. Uh, remember in Isaiah 9, uh, uh, Yeshua would be called the mighty God, the everlasting father. He's also called the counselor, the prince of peace. Uh, so God asked that question as well. Uh, is thy counselor perished? Is, has he died? Well, certainly he did. Um, For pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. And this, by the way, is a daughter of Zion. It's not Zion. It's the daughter of Zion. So it's the offspring speaking of today that, we're, that the Jews would be living today. But he says, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field. I wanted to read this part here again for this one scripture here. You're going to go out of the city. You have to remember, Revelation 11 clearly says, by the way, for my Jewish brothers and sisters, John was a Jew. Hello, Yochanan. 
He was Jewish. God showed him in visions and everything that what? The Gentiles are going to be given the outer court and they will what? Tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. Well, part of that negotiation deal, according to Daniel's prophecy in chapter 11, that that prince that shall come, that comes up strong with a small people, being the Palestinians, the Palestinians get a little deal in this as well, and their deal is to get East Jerusalem uh, for themselves as part of their capital. This is why we're seeing Palestinians marching through the streets, marching on the Temple Mount, shouting and screaming, away with the Jews, out of Jerusalem, get the Jews out of Jerusalem. Why? They already know. They know that there's been a covenant sign. The Jews, you know, this is the funny thing. The Jewish people don't even have no idea. They have no idea that the government, as much as the government keeps denying it, you know, if, if, if Israel did not sign some kind of covenant with the Vatican, then pray tell me, why is the Catholic Church allowed to march into the tomb of King David? Now, I could understand it if it had been the church just kind of marched in there uh, in protest to all the Orthodox Jews and there would have been a fight and a clash and they'd have thrown them out. That would have been different. But it wasn't like that. The police, the Israeli police, special forces, wearing yarmulkes, take and force them, force the Jews out of King David's tomb and bring these uh, cross-bearing Catholic monks into the tomb of David to have a Mass, to celebrate their Mass, their Eucharist, to, to celebrate their worship of their sun god. So much could be said on that. Anyway, so they tread the holy city underfoot 40 and two months. To tread is, you know, God told Abraham, wherever the soles of your foot step, that I have given you. Hello, think about it. They shall tread, they, they shall be, they are given the outer court. The Gentiles are given the outer court and they will what? Tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. God said to Abraham, wherever your feet tread, that ground I have what? Given you. So they're treading on the ground that Israel has given them. Is I don't care how much that you want to deny it. If you send the military in to enforce it, you've given something to, to, to the Catholic Church that didn't belong to them. My, bro, my Jewish brethren, fear not. It's only three and a half years that we got to go through this. There's going to be a lot of heartache because clearly in Micah 4 it also says, Be in pain and labor to bring forth a daughter of Zion like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city. See, you've already been in travail for nine months under John Kerry. And, and see, John Kerry, this, this deal with John Kerry in, in America to do this two-state solution, that was, that was just a smokescreen to get your attention somewhere else. It caught my attention at first as well. But not long after that, I realized that the negotiation wasn't the Palestinians and Israel. All along, it was the Vatican and Israel. And sure enough, we know that Rome is Esau and Israel is Jacob. And yes, now that their nine-month negotiation has come to an end, what did they do? Shimon Perez, Abbas, everybody goes over to the Vatican there and they have their little prayer thing with Pope Francis there. Why? And they put the little olive tree in the garden, you know, plant the little olive tree and they all throw the little dirt in, you know. They're signifying it. They're, they're, they're letting the world know we've agreed. We're in agreement now. But remember, the Bible says that one that comes in with flatteries, there you go, Daniel chapter 11, he'll come in peaceably with flatteries, saying, peace, peace. See, there is no peace. It's all just a charade. All right, now, I said all this because I'm wanting to show, show you something that I, this has been in my heart for a long time. I just never have spoke it yet because God had never revealed anything to me about this, but he just kept leading me to look at what happened with the Exodus compared to what's going to happen here in the very near future. And so I wanted to share something with you. It's a, a, a little something that 
it kind of just blew my own mind away today. When you go to Exodus chapter 7, the Lord says to Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt, but Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you. In other words, he won't listen to you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people and to the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Now, we're seeing history repeat itself. See, it's no wonder, and this is for my Jewish friends that, 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 that watch this video as well, and you guys would be surprised how many Jewish people do watch it. They do watch. Believe me, they do. Um, you might say, wait a minute. That's, this, is Moses, this is God talking about Moses way down there in Egypt. No, let me tell you something. You're missing the whole ball game here. Did you not realize that right there in Jerusalem, that is considered Egypt? Hmm. Didn't know that one. In fact, my daughter, five years old, uh, I've noticed her keep saying this one thing over and over. And I, I really, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out where she's getting this from. Now I begin to wonder if it's not the Lord leading her. She's watching this evangelist on TV today. Um, believe it or not, she's, she's watching. And as she watches him, very well-known evangelist, I, I've, I've seen him before uh, in person, and... Um, won't call his name, but she says to me, he don't love Jesus, Daddy. And I'm like, what? I said, sure he does. She says, oh, no, he loves Egypt. I'm like, I said, what, what do you mean he loves Egypt? She said, he loves Egypt. He has no love for Jesus. That blew me away. But I've seen her do that before about someone that doesn't love the Lord. She always uses the word, he loves Egypt. Well, ironically, in Revelation 11, we find out that the two witnesses, when they are killed, the Bible says that their bodies will lay there in the street spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Well, he was crucified right there on top of Golgotha, where you can see the skull face in the mountainside there, where there's now there's a Muslim cemetery. This is where Yeshua, Jesus, was crucified, and the two witnesses will be killed at this exact same location. And ironically, it's called Egypt. Now, I wonder why God would call this place Egypt. Well, it really comes down to the battle that God is fighting against Satan. And you see, because why? The Pharaoh of Egypt, all he was was Satan incarnated in a human body. And the Antichrist today, or you might say the false prophet, I know some people, we have different opinions on that, that's all right, but let's just say it like this here. The false prophet today, who I believe to be none other than the Pope of Rome, and it doesn't matter to me whether it be Pope Francis or if they want to get him another guy. I don't care which one it's going to be. Nonetheless, it, that's where your false prophet will come out of. That's your Antichrist, so to speak. But what is it about that? Satan will incarnate that man. Now, I don't believe that full incarnation is there as of yet. Because when that happens, it's really going to get bad. But nonetheless, what, what I am seeing here, I saw something here in the story of the Exodus that I never picked up on before. And that's what I want to share with you here. And it comes down to the Moses rod. So let's drop down a couple of verses here. Let's go to verse 7. And Moses was forced, oh, excuse me, not verse 7, verse 8. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, say, saying, Show a miracle for you, then you shall take uh, unto Aaron, take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went into, into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod. 
and became a serpent, and Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not, or he heard not unto them, and the Lord, or listened not to them, and the Lord, uh, excuse me, as the Lord had said. Now, this is the point I wanted to bring out to you. You ever wonder why God had Moses use this for that first miracle? Now, it's kind of ironic. God only tells Moses about two signs that he's going to give him. He doesn't speak about the plagues that he's going to have him do. Nowhere does he reveal this to Moses in the beginning, but he gives him that sign of the serpent, his staff into a serpent, and of course, his hand to leprosy or something like leprosy, whatever that was in the healing of his hand again. Well, I think I know why. You see, when God, when God sends Moses in the face of Pharaoh, this is why God says Moses would be God to Pharaoh. God knew that in that man called Pharaoh, that Satan himself had incarnated that man just as he did in the Garden of Eden. He incarnated that serpent right there. And when he did, he caused man to fall. And he brought sin into the world. Death set in to the world. This has a lot to do with what goes on in Egypt. The battle is not between flesh and blood. This battle is between God and Satan. And so what God does when he has Moses come in there and he throws that rod down and it becomes a serpent. See, now, Pharaoh, he, no doubt it angered him what happened there. So he has his little magicians come out and do the same thing. But when Moses' rod swallows up the serpents or the rods of the other ones there, he swallows them up and then they take that rod by the tail, that snake by the tail, and it turns into a rod again. God is letting the devil know, I have got full control over you. And you can't do anything. It's the same thing when God had Moses when the people were dying and, and, and they'd been bitten by serpents because God was angry with them and their sins. Then he took and he said, take a serpent, a brazen serpent, a brass serpent, put it on a pole, form it. Have the people come and look, and look at this and they will live. See, why? God was showing that he had judged sin. He'd, he'd brought that judgment in. He had control of Satan. And that's what he's doing with Pharaoh right there. He's showing Pharaoh, I control the whole show. When you got into that serpent, I control that serpent. He's letting Pharaoh know, I'm controlling you as well. This is why Pharaoh gets his heart hardened and why Pharaoh relaxes. His heart is hardened and his, and his heart relaxes. Just like that serpent, God has Moses throw that, that staff down. It turns to a serpent. He can grab it by the tail, go back to a stick again. Why? God is controlling everything. And so God is letting the devil know, you might be in that body, but I'm going to make you obey everything I say. You will do whatever I want in my hand. You will do exactly what I want you to do. Everything was for God's glory. It's the same thing with the first plague that comes out when God has Moses strike the river and it turns to blood and then death sets in. Why? Because the first sin that came on the earth after Adam and Eve had sinned there was Cain rose up and slew his brother, excuse me, Abel. Yeah, Cain raises up and kills his brother Abel. Again, the plague has something to do with what happened in the Garden of Eden. The last plague is the plague of death. Judgment. And that's also, by the way, what you find in Revelation when you look at the plagues over there. Isn't it interesting that God has Moses and Elijah or their nature, their ministries re-impersonated, we might say, according to Revelations 11, and we find that it's turning the waters to blood. Is one of them. You know, it's closing up the heavens that it rains not in the days of their ministry, just like Elijah did. But it's kind of ironic, though, because that serpent, uh, excuse me, the, 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 he also, one of the last plagues that's poured out is death. Same thing God did with, with Pharaoh when he killed the firstborn of all the children. Now, some people were saying that was God paying back Pharaoh for what he did when he killed all the firstborn trying to get a hold of Moses. 
But you have to understand, go back to Genesis. That's what happened there. That's why Cain raises up and kills his brother Abel. Satan is always trying to put a stop to God's word. But God let Moses know, I've got you by the tail. And you ain't going nowhere. So I kind of thought that that was interesting. Now this is what's going to happen with uh, the Pope of Rome. The Pope of Rome basically is the modern day Pharaoh today. He, you have to remember, Pharaoh of Egypt was not only the political leader of the world, he was the spiritual leader of the world. It's the same thing the Pope of Rome is. That's why he has the two keys on his flag. He's the both spiritual and political leader of the world. All the spiritual dignitaries come to Rome and are joining back in, and they're actually saying it. We're coming back to the mother. We're coming back to our mother church. Great, well-known evangelists and charismatic leaders and, and denominational leaders are all saying, we're coming back to the mother church. Even when we've seen this prayer that went on over there with uh, Shimon Perez and Mahmoud Abbas and the Muslim leaders and, and, and Christian leaders, and oh, look, how, look at how nonsense this is. It shows right there that everyone is coming back to mama. So the Pope of Rome, just like the Pharaoh of Egypt, is spiritual and political leader of the world. And all the political leaders go to the Pope as well. Even down to China now. Is there not a spirit, is there not a political leader in the world that has not come to the Pope now? I'm talking about Tribal people come to the Pope. I mean, this people that do not open their eyes with this is, is just beyond me. Now, let me just share a few other things here with you real quick, and we're going to close. Um, I'd said to you many, many times in the past. In fact, uh, Brother John uh, recently sent me a thing. He says, Brother Steve, did you know that when God says, or as Moses says to God, you know, they'll ask me, what is your name? Uh, he says that they never asked what the name of God was. They never asked him that question. I said, Brother John, how long have you been listening? You haven't heard me say that already. <laughs> so it's kind of cute. But no, yeah, that's right. I've been preaching that now for a couple of years. You know, it's an unfulfilled prophecy. Moses says, they will ask me, Mashimo, what is your name? And God answers him, tell them, I am that I am sent you. The funny thing is, though, they never ask Moses what his name is. It really applies more for today. You see, because the children of Israel are wondering, what is God's name? Not only that, it would take Moses to be able to unravel all this mess that they're in. All the mess they're in with the laws and the oral law and everything else. You know, if God will send, whether he sends a literal Moses back, whether he sends a, a, a man anointed with the Holy Spirit that's in the same nature of Moses, whatever it will be, it will be a supernatural thing where God himself will reveal to Israel. It'll be someone that God, if it's an anointing that is, they would be so anointed as if it were Moses himself standing here with the laws that God gave that he would be able to clearly point them and show them this oral tradition that you call my law, that's not my law. What I wrote, this is my law. This is what God gave us to live by. And then he would also be able to show them by the word of God, this is where Mashiach is. He's right here. He's right there. He's right here. See, it's just like the fact that Moses says in, in, in the 15th chapter of Exodus, when he says right here, um, then sang Moses unto the children of Israel this song say, uh, uh, unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. You know, in the Hebrew language, it clearly is in the future tense. Um, Moses actually is clearly uh, speaking of coming in the future, singing this wonderful song of redemption, and that the horse and the rider 
his writer, by the way, and, and I'll just share that with you real quick so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it says, You know, I will sing this song uh, to the Lord. And we will say, Le'amor, Ashera. See? I will sing, Ladonai. Kiga Agao, Sus Berekevo. See, I will say unto the Lord that the horse and his rider, Ramabeyom, have been thrown or hurled into the sea. That's, isn't it interesting? He speaks about a future redemption of Israel. And there's one horse and one rider. That's a lot like Revelation as well. Not Zechariah, where he speaks of two horses, in each case, two white horses, two red horses, etc. But in the case here in Revelation, there's one horse, one rider. Now, it's interesting. The horses change colors. But I wonder, is it different riders or the same man? I believe that's Satan each time riding those horses. And I also believe that Satan is in the Pope. And it's going to be him that God is going to confront. The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. It's not anybody else's. But this is why Moses says that he will sing that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. You see, the thing is, Egypt was not fully destroyed. That's why we see Egypt in power, in a, as a power today. But this time, God is going to wipe them out. But today, it's Rome. It's no longer the Egypt of the Middle East. But it's interesting, though, that in the Bible, when God writes about it over in Revelation, He calls that spiritually Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Why? Because God knew that Pharaoh would come there. This is why you see the Vatican gaining control in Jerusalem today. This is why we see the Palestinians running through those streets crying out all the Jews to get out. Get out of Jerusalem. Get out of Jerusalem. It's already been told to them that they've been given this area. They're just wanting it to hurry up and to be fulfilled. Now, in closing, let me just share with you one other thing, and that's in the book of uh, Revelation, the 15th chapter. And in Revelation chapter 15, it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the, the, uh, having the, the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now remember those plagues, just like Moses goes and brings out the plagues on Egypt, we're having these plagues here. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. That's kind of interesting. Didn't Moses deliver the children of Israel across the Red Sea? Now we got one that's a sea of glass mingled with fire. And, <clears throat> and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. The song of Moses is the redemption over Pharaoh and over his horse and over his rider. Seems like Moses must have come back and taught them something, didn't he? It's kind of interesting, though, we don't see Moses with them there. Perhaps that's because he's one of those witnesses that are killed. But the redemption has already taken place. And they go on to say one other word here that I really like. And the song of the Lamb. Must be a bunch of Jewish people that have recognized who Mashiach really is. I find it interesting. Anyway, let's watch and see how the things unfold here in Israel as it happens day to day. It is such a blessing. It's an exciting thing to see what part of history we're sitting in. And uh, I trust and pray that you pray for us. We'll be praying for you. Pray for your loved ones. Don't just pray for them. Talk to them about the hour we're living in because we're watching Bible prophecy manifest right before our eyes. I've talked about all these things being prophetic, but I never, it's, it's almost hard to imagine that we're literally watching things come to pass as it happens. God bless you. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon with Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, and good night.